You're now watching the lifestyle segment on the weekend show brought to you by Holo Crunch Popcorn. Today we will be discussing um, sickle cell disease as we mark the World Sickle Cell Day. Now, sickle cell disease is an inherited blood disorder that causes a sickle, um, a sickle shaped cells and a, a sickle shaped red blood cells that can stick together blocking blood flow and oxygen from reaching all parts of the body. People with sickle cell disease can experience pain, anemia, infection and other health problems also known as complications or crisis that may require care by a healthcare provider. When health problems such as serious pain also known as crisis cannot be managed at home, a visit to a healthcare provider or a visit to a healthcare provider is not possible. Children and adults with sickle cell disease often require, require um, care in hospital emergency departments or clinics for treatment. The theme for the World Sickle Cell Day for 2021 is shine the light on sickle cell disease. Now, sickle cell disease is a group of red blood cell disorders. World Sickle Cell Day is observed on June 19 globally. The main motive of commemoration of this day is to promote knowledge about sickle cell disease amongst the general public. What's a sickle cell anemia? Why does it matter? This and more will be discussed on this show. Having this conversation with me is Ahmed Usman. Welcome to the weekend show. Thank you very much. Also, um, he is the coordinator of the Grace Sickle Cell Foundation. Also joining us virtually is Maureen Uwachi, Program Manager, Sickle Cell Advocacy and Management Initiative. And Josephine Opoho, Team Lead, Audrey Sickle Cell Foundation. Welcome to the weekend show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So we'll start with Thank you, for having you Ahmed. Why is it important to um, commemorate the World Sickle Cell Day? Um, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, sickle cell is a condition that has you know, um, continued to um, develop across Nigeria. Um, over the years, the statistics have made for very grim reading. Um, so over 150,000 kids and children born with the condition every year in Nigeria. Um, these numbers have shown no sign of slowing. And um, only about you know, um, 5 to 10% um, of these kids grow up to live past the age of five due to complications arising from staphylococci and um, H influenza. So it's very, very important to bring this to the notice of the government, um, you know, because as it is now, there is a lack of, you know, interest, there's a neglect, you know, um, for um, the battle against sickle cell, you know, on the part of the government. And um, bringing this to their attention, I believe will do more harm than good, or will do more good than harm, rather. So, over the years, we've had a bit of awareness about sickle cell disease, and thanks to people like you are constantly informing people. Have we been able to witness any significant change in the numbers? Because um, almost every year we hear it's about 150,000 yeah. births. Do we, has this number changed? Are there really any improvements so the far? Numbers have largely remained the same. Um, and that is why there needs to be a concerted effort, you know, to getting sensitization, you know, the awareness, hosting seminars and what have you to make sure that, you know, more people, um, both, you know, um, in urban areas, rural areas are kept informed. And they're not just informed, but kept informed um, about like the dangers and the risk of, you know, um, sickle cell and understanding that for people who may not necessarily live with um, the sickle cell condition, carrying the traits alone um, poses a risk to um, um, unborn kids. And um, this is the message we have to keep hammering and driving across. It's not, you know, it's not a one um, seminar kind of message. It has to be continuous and um, it has to be long lasting. Okay, let's bring in the team lead of the Audrey Sickle Cell Foundation who is joining us um, virtually. Why, um, why is this important? And can you tell us about the work which um, you've been doing so far regarding um, sickle cell disease awareness um, with the Audrey Sickle Cell Foundation? Okay, uh, we started in 2018, that's 2018, with our founder, Mrs. Miss Audrey Mukuru. 
Okay, our work is basically to create awareness about the sickle cell disease. And as so, well, so just tell people, especially those who are carriers like AS, inform them on the need not to get married, not even so, not to think about it. Because I, for me, I think it's selfish. You know that if you go ahead with this thing, your unborn kids will suffer. Why be selfish? Just look for someone else that you're compatible with. It's not just about you. It's about your future. Your children are your future. So our work is basically to create this awareness, make a lot of noise about it, as well as to create a support group for those who are already living with sickle cell disease, because there are a lot of challenges living as a sickle cell warrior. That's what we do here at Audrey Sickle Cell Foundation. So how do you carry out this awareness in a way where it's not like you're scolding these people, um, you're actually um, educating them on the need um, to check their blood group, their genotypes and all before marriage? Okay, we take the message to them wherever they are, in the schools, in the marketplace, wherever we meet them. Most times we have events, programs, like the Poloco Market campaign, we went there twice. First, to educate them on the need to know their genotype, because most people don't know, especially those who are not exposed, those who are not, who didn't go to school. They don't have this awareness, especially market women, businessmen, they don't know these things. So we go there to tell them on the need to know. First, who are you? Know your genotype. After that, know the genotype of your spouse. If you're already married with kids, know their genotype, so you know how to manage them. Those who are sickle cell warriors, you know how to manage them. Those who are carriers, you know how to educate them. We even went there again to do a free genotype test for them. So this is what we do. We go to schools, we go to churches, we go everywhere. People invite us, we just go and we keep saying these things because people need to hear it. Okay, um, let's bring in Maureen, um, the Program Manager of Sickle Cell Advocacy um, and Management Initiative. What role do you think the government has to play in shining the light on sickle cell disease? Because most of the awareness which we see so far is being done by um, NGOs and foundations and organizations such as um, the ones run by three of you on this program. So what, what role does government currently play and what should they do um, to shine the light on sickle cell to reduce the numbers? Maureen. Okay, currently the government, um, I wouldn't say they are playing, playing much role. Um, apart from perhaps self-subsidizing um, hospital, hospitalization um, bills for people generally. But apart from that, the government will play a major role when they create policies that would um, enable people who live with sickle cell leave better lives, policies that would help um, solve things like stigmatization, policies that would help, um, you know, keep labs in check, labs and hospitals in check that causes um, forms of mismanagement, which can lead to death, um, laboratories, we, we, laboratories that are responsible for giving out um, fake genotype test results or poor genotype test um, testing, um, using poor genotype testing equipment or that are ill-equipped to test to do this testing because this is a major problem policies that would help um enlighten the um <clears throat> the public okay so when i say the public like um if we have a curriculum that can address sickle cell as part of um maybe a topic in biology proper sickle cell um education in biology or in integrated science i think it will go a long way to you know communicating um or bringing enlightenment to the public so these are the things that the government can do for us and many more okay maureen um so 
the, the larger number of people suffering from um, sickle cell disease or the warriors, uh, most of the numbers now are from people in the rural area. And it's good that you mentioned curriculum, but we also have a high rate of people who are out of school and um, uneducated. How can we reach out to enlighten the people in the rural areas who may not have access to satellite TV or to um, the basic education where they could be taught this? What can we do getting to the grassroots, the bottom of it? Okay, this is where patient-based organizations such as ours who can team up with OM the government at those levels. We have local governments and um, things like that. So we can team them to create um, awareness, bring it down to the grassroots, speak the languages these people understand, just like what we did with one of our, um, some of our programs, like where I am now. Um, we are running, we do run a free clinic dedicated to people living with sickle cell. We've been running it for over six years, consistently every month. and. One of the things we ensure to do is to bring language um, or interpreters who can interpret what, what is being said every time so that they can understand time. And I've, I think I have found that from other patient-based organizations who are based in these, some of these rural areas, I think they, they are doing better jobs. People on, tend to understand them better compared to people who live in the urban um, city who feel they are more educated and can, mm, I can shrug this thing off. It's not just sickle cell. I know somebody who lives with sickle cell and lives well. I, I can marry who I like. But these people, when you talk to them, they listen. So this, uh, this is one of um, the ways which we can, patient-based organizations teaming up with um, the government at those level, local governments, um, primary health centers in these rural areas can team up with them to create this awareness, bring it down to their level for them to understand the teaching aids and um, things that will not create language barrier speak Th the language they understand thank you Josephine and Maureen and Mamed, I'll come back to you and so you've heard what they've said do you have some more input when it comes to what government can do um, to increase this awareness and um, provide better health care for um, warriors suffering from the sickle cell disease? Um, just briefly, I think um, they've said a lot, um, just to add a few things to what they've said, you know, they talked about policy, it talks about going down to the grassroots and, you know, communicating with people directly, um, even trying to integrate more sickle cell based topics in uh, into our um, curriculum very, very important. Um, in addition to some of these things, there are also other, you know, um, ways that we can push policy. Um, for example, for the education sector, for kids and children in um, <coughs> secondary and primary schools, I think they can create um, or they can be um, a um, proper way to get them to receive treatment um, and still be part of you know, their school um, curriculum and still keep pace with their peers. Um, for example, you know, for some of them who have to drop out of school at certain points during the term, you know, to attend to their health issues, if there can be an e-learning, you know, system where they can still, you know, be able to um, keep up with their peers and um, um, not fall behind in terms of their academics. On the other hand, um, there could be maybe a social welfare program, like a safety net um, covering parents who have kids with sickle cell, I think the aim of this would be, you know, just to create a separate fund where parents can access to treat, you know, um, their sickle cell warriors and ensure that they live, you know, long and joyous lives. Because if you do the right things, a lot of people find that, you know, um, crises become less and less when you, you know, live the right, live the right lifestyle, you eat the right things, you know, um, you take your drugs, you consult with your uh, medical practitioner very often. So, just to add to what they've said, I think these are more things that can be you know, so integrated. So, something which I've noticed over the years, um, in the good old days before Twitter was suspended, um, there, almost every other day you see someone asking for blood donors. Um, and I get those calls a lot where someone needs um, blood. And so, every other month or every three months, at least, some some people, um, some of us go to donate blood, and I don't see how sustainable this is. Where once um, a warrior is in crisis, 
then we see we put out a call for blood donation. How can we create a sustainable way to have blood banks provide and allocate or keep blood for um, warriors in the event when they need transfusion and the likes? Um, how can we bridge that gap? Because that's a problem, isn't it? Yes, um, this obviously need the um, input of private hospitals, government hospitals, specialty hospitals as well, the federal government, you know, myself, yourself, um, national blood transfusion system um, at all times, you know, would have to have an intense um, level of attention to the detail in terms of having a database constantly. You don't really need an emergency situation to, you know, um, keep or want to like store blood. I think at, at all times during the year, you have to always ensure that, you know, you're constantly improving your database, you're seeking out donors, and um, they are con donating their blood into this um, red, um, or these blood, packed blood cells, as they call it. Um, very, very necessary. The problem that a lot of people have encountered is um, they only um, try to get help when, you know, um, an emergency situation has beckoned on them. So it's very, very important to ensure that um, this blood transfusion system is always kept updated. The database is updated. They are constantly soliciting, you know, for donors and, you know, trying to make sure that people are, you know, um, donating blood all year round. So, um with, with scientific um, discoveries and research, I hear of bone marrow transplants and um, some medical um, practices which could help. Um, how, what's the success rate of the bone marrow transplant and how feasible is it? Um, or, and also how expensive? Is it affordable for any or every other person? Um, as great as the bone marrow transplants um, or as great as the innovation has been, there's still you know, an issue of, obviously, you mentioned um, expensive. It's out of reach for the average Nigerian family. Not just the average Nigerian family, the average Indian family, which is the other country that bears the burden of, you know, um, the sickle cell numbers. 90% um, of people living with sickle cell are, you know, either Nigerians, Indians, or um, Congolese. Um, it's still out of reach for the average Nigerian family, who, obviously, you know, um, many people live, you know, below the poverty line as a, developed, a developing country. Um, also, the transplant itself is not 100% effective. I think there's a 60-40% chance, and hasn't even been, you know, um, conservative or charitable. Um, it's still um, a procedure that needs um, a lot of more innovation breakthroughs, you know, because they have to ensure that um, people's lives um, are still very well protected in the aftermath of the transplant. So it's not a transplant that has a 100% success rate. So for that reason, you know, science, innovation, um, technology has to keep improving to where, you know, we'll be looking at success rates in the 90s. So for now, it's still, you know, um, very much something that I believe will need a few years, you know, to be fully consolidated as technology continues to improve. But what we can keep doing is making sure that the people who are already born with sickle cell live long and healthy lives and obviously start cutting down these numbers. Um, um, gradually, you know, until, you know, we're talking about five to 10,000 people born with sickle cell every year, which will be a success from where, you know, we're at currently. Okay, um, so as we reel this conversation in, just then, um, on the World Sickle Cell Day for 2021, what's your final message to um, um, people around the world and Nigerians on um, sickle cell disease? Okay, first off, I'm just going to encourage everyone to go check their genotype. It is very necessary, and I'm going to encourage everyone living with sickle cell to know that they are not alone. They don't stand alone. We have people like them living normal life as well, and there are a lot of support groups they can join, learn about the disease and how to live with them. Also, I would like to speak to guardians, especially of sickle cell warriors. It's not an easy task. I would want to encourage them to be strong, especially for their words, because it's not easy. Always being in the hospital or in a state of crisis is not easy. So I would want to encourage them to keep strong, keep doing the good work, and in the end, we'll all be happy. That's my final word for them. Okay, and uh, Maureen, what's your final word and how can your organization be reached for more inf information? 
Um, okay, so you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and um, Instagram at Sami Update, S A M I Update. So, um, my final words to warriors and everyone out there Sickle Cell is not a death sentence. It's, um, it's <laughs> I think everyone should understand that all hands need to be on deck. Every, when I mean everyone, I mean everyone. It used to be known as um, a black man's disease, but today I, I am not so sure it is a black man's disease anymore with the rate of interracial marriages going on. So it's no longer a black man's disease. I, I mean, gradually you can hear people in France saying they have people who have sickle cell and they are not black people in America, in Asia, in the Middle East. So all hands need to be on deck. It's going to it affect all of us one way or the other, directly or indirectly. Directly, if you have someone who lives with sickle cell in your family, indirectly, somehow it affects for, for instance, like I say, the, the, the burden is um, so high here in Nigeria that a lot of young people who should be contributing to the economic growth of the community cannot do so because of sickle cell, either due to stigmatization or because some of them were unable to finish school and cannot do anything due to their ill um, health issues. So that also invariably, you know, translates to um, the economy somehow, the economic growth. So it's, it's something that everyone should be aware of. It's not a death sentence. It's not a disease you can catch. So it's not something you should discriminate against or um, run away from. So um, I think that's it for everyone and for warriors out there. Thank you very much, Maureen. Ahmed, um, we hear stigmatization a lot when we have this conversation. What can we do to reduce the uh, stigmatization and what can viewers at home do to help support, um, shine the light on sickle cell disease and also provide um, support to warriors? Um, it's very, very important for viewers at home to understand that they are all stakeholders in the fight against sickle cell, not just the foundations, not just the government, not just the health experts or um, um, uh, private sector um, stakeholders. Every single person has a role to play. You have a role to inform your family, um, you have a role to inform your neighbours, you have a role to inform people at work and to ensure that you know people living with sickle cell understand that you know they can move at their pace. You know there's no need to rush them or make them feel inferior. They're human beings like us. They deserve love, care, attention um, and if anything they even deserve more attention than you know um, a lot of people who can go about their daily um, lives without um, complications. So we should stand with them, uh, we should stand by them, and um, we should um, always ensure that the only way we can continue to improve you know, their lives is by creating awareness and making sure that these numbers are reduced. So, How can your organization be reached for people who want support? Oh, um, you can reach us at um, La Grace um, Foundation on Instagram. Um, La Grace at La Grace SCF on Twitter, obviously depending when the Twitter ban is reversed. Um, on our website, um, lagrace.org, and um, La Grace Sickle Cell Foundation at yahoo.com and at gmail.com. You know, two emails. Um, that's how we can be reached via email. You can ask questions, you can log into our website, um, try and um, um, volunteer. You know, for um, some of our projects in the pipeline and. Um, just engage us and, you know, any way that you want us to come in or you want to come in, we'll always be on hand to um, offer help. Thank you very much, Ahmed, Thank Maureen, you. and Josephine. And to our viewers at home, you've heard it. Today is World Sickle Cell Day, but they go through this every single day and every year. And so it's our duty to provide support, to reduce the stigmatization, and just to be show empathy for people who are going through um, some of these struggles. Um, we do have more on the weekend show. Don't go away. We'll be back shortly. <laughs>